second webinar of our new Global Health Matters live webinar series. I'm Hal Ali, and I'm part of coordinator of Easter Island program at the Irish Global Health Network. Please be reminded that we will have another webinar on planetary health coming up at the end of June. We will be hosting experts to discuss the most topical and pressing issues on global health. Today's topic is the COVID-19 humanitarian crisis in India, situation and response. During this live event, we will hear from speakers leading their organization's response from Indian frontline health care workers and researchers to advocates, NGOs, the Irish Health Service Executive and the World Health Organization. A recording of this webinar will be available in our websites and YouTube channel shown on the chat, uh, Irish Global Health Network. Live streaming is also available right now on our YouTube channel. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen or the chat box. For now, I will leave you with my co-hosts for today, Nadine Fris france Executive Director of Irish Global Health Network and Easter Island, and Matthew, Professor and Chairperson of uh, Bachelor of Science, Health and Society at Dublin City University, and also the outgoing Chair of the Irish Global Health Network. Welcome, Nadine and Anne. Thank you, Hala. Um, great, well, we are all watching the situation in India. And it's like watching the, the worst that we could have imagined with COVID-19, it's actually happening. You know, we know that official figures report 27 million cases with over 300,000 deaths. And that was as of last week. And we know that that is grossly underestimated. Um, today we have an opportunity and we're really privileged to have an opportunity to hear from our friends and our colleagues in India and those working to respond to this crisis. So without further delay, let me introduce you to the speakers that we have. Myself and Anne are going to introduce you today. Uh, we first up have Dr. Pooja Ramakant. Uh, Pooja, you are so welcome. She is a professor in, the, in uh, the endocrine and breast surgery department at King George's Medical University, and we'll, we'll refer to that as uh, KGMU. Uh, Dr. Pooja has published papers in various national and international outlets, and she's authored two Hindi books. She's also editor-in-chief of the Indian Journal of the Endocrine Surgery and Research, and she has been working at the front line at the KGMU hospital um, that has been turned into a, a full COVID-19 facility. Pooja, you're so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Nadine. And uh, thank you for giving me this platform to share my views with you. And thanks mm. to the Irish Global Health Network. It is our pleasure. Um, thank you, Pooja. We're also joined today by Dr. Uh, Dr. Archana Siwag, and she is a global health professional working in the clinical management for COVID-19 team at the Health Emergencies Program at WHO. And she has um, a big role there, um, an important role to provide technical support and coordination and project management support to the incident management team and other partners in strengthening case management and response activities. Uh, previously, she's worked as a consultant to the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare in the government of India and as a clinician at the Fortis International Hospital in Bangalore. So welcome, 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 Archana. And Anne. Thanks, Nadine. Our next speaker will be Dr. Mohammed Hakmal, Senior International Public Health Expert and Chevening Scholar. Dr. Hakmal is an award-winning Senior International Public Health and Health Systems Innovation Expert. And with 18 years of experience in public health projects in South and Central Asia, he is well-versed and prepared to share his experiences about the challenges and gaps in the healthcare domain, especially during emergencies and the pandemic. Currently, he's a lecturer at this University of City London in the UK, and Dr. Hakmal qualified as a medical doctor in Afghanistan in 2003. So welcome, Dr. Hakmal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, then we'll hear from Dr. David Weekliam, who is the Global Health Program Director of the Health Service Executive of Ireland. Uh, Dr. Weekliam is a leader and advocate on global health issues in Ireland and globally. He trained as a medical specialist in general practice and public health medicine and has worked since 1988 in global health, including 11 years leading and managing health prom programs in Sudan, Liberia, Nepal, Ghana, and the DRC and was a former chairperson as well of the Irish Global Health Network. So welcome, David. Um, 
Next then we'll have Charlotte Kavna, Chief Fundraising Officer and Communications Executive for the Hope Foundation. Uh, Charlotte uh, is with the Hope Foundation, as I say, and she's been working with that foundation since 2011, sorry, 2012, supporting fundraising efforts for Hope's work, which is to promote the protection of street children and slum children living in slums in Calcutta some of the most uh, underprivileged children in India. So Charlotte, thanks for joining us today as well. Nadine. And then last but not least, we have Dr. Shahid Siddiqui. He's a, me a media activist and journalist, and he specializes in the social development sector. He's also a campaigner for human rights in India. And currently he's researching the situation on the ground and working to support COVID, uh, COVID citizens, infected citizens in, um, in rural area in particular. He's also the founder of the Association for Community Research and Action, and he's going to be a respondent today to respond to what he hears. So you're very, very welcome. So I think we will we will start if we can um, coming to you, um, Dr. Pooja. Uh, we know that you're in Lucknow. Um, it's the province of Uttar Pradesh. It's about 600 kilometers from Delhi. As I said, in the, in the KGMU, St. George's Medical University, and um, it's one of the biggest government hospitals. And again, fully converted at the moment into a COVID facility. Can you describe the situation in the hospital at the moment? And um, what is it like? Your own role, for example, and what is it like for for patients? and for doctors like yourself. Nadine, thank you for describing. And uh, it is a really tough time. And you can see the beautiful building of King George's Medical University. But however, in the present difficult times, it has been really converted into COVID hospital. We are having 4,000 bedded hospital. 1,000 beds are already confined to the COVID patients. And then now we have post-COVID ward also, ICUs plus mucormycosis, fungal infections have grown up. So another team has been dedicated for that. So our roles are in multiple ways. Some of us, there are a lot of task forces. Some of us are posted in COVID wards. Some of us in the COVID ICU, some of us in the theaters, and some of us managing non-COVID semi-emergency or emergency works also. So it is by rotation, each one of us is doing the duties and we are very short staffed because we are distributed in different places. So that way it's a very tough time managing the COVID uh, patients. However, in April to May, it was very difficult, but now the peak has come down. So the cases has come down, but in April, it was really tough and very difficult for us. Some of us uh, even had relatives and uh, ourselves got positive and were on leave and so it was very difficult to manage all the things together and and puja is it um, is the hospital at at full capacity still no now i think 60 percent uh, today i asked in the morning 60 percent beds have been occupied 40 percent are vacant in the icus around 70 percent beds are occupied but 30 percent are vacant that's a huge number but now we have around uh, 186 mucormycosis patients who have undergone surgery. So that way the beds are occupied in the scattered way, but not like 100% occupancy now. And Dr. Pooja, you mentioned um, that some of you, you know, you're rotating around and some of you in, are, are still, you know, you're doing what you can in emergency surgeries. What's happening with the other emergency healthcare? care? Um, how are you managing with that? What are the kind of issues that you have to deal with? Yeah, you can see as a pictures, it's very difficult for patients to come for transportation because of the lockdown and many issues. So like cancer patients, patients having trauma, any sort of emergencies, cardiology, any heart attacks. So gynecology, all the patients for deliveries or any issues. So we, are, we have a team dedicated for emergencies. So there's a protocol, the patients come and they get managed, but then it's very difficult. And patients have to pay a huge price coming to hospital also. That's also a difficult thing because of transportation issues. So that way, emergency, semi-emergencies, even the cancer work is going on. However, 28 million elective uh, theaters have been, uh, surgeries have been cancelled or postponed. So theaters have been shut down since last three weeks. Elective theaters. So surgeries have been postponed. And we expect like in June to return back to get our elective theatre list starting off. Right now we are doing only emergencies and semi-emergency works. 
And when you're thinking ahead then, you know, as, as things open up again and um, you go back to more uh, re routine surgeries, um, how, how are you going to cope with that? What kind of plans are in place um, for you to, to, to just try and deal with what, what you need to address? Yeah, we have stratified uh, even the cancer surgeries. Among that, we have classified them into as semi-emergency, urgent, and uh, which we can wait. So some patients like who are, we have given chemotherapies, some patients who are on oral chemotherapies or oral hormonal therapies in which like early breast cancers, they need surgery fast. So that way we have restratified who needs surgery sooner will be operated first. We have noted down all the numbers and the details. So the whole OT list already has been made for June month and for July. So that waiting list has been popping up and uh, patients who can be delayed without harming the disease progression that way, those patients have been shifted back. And Dr. Pooja, those photographs that we're looking at on the screen there, can you tell us a little about that? People are in queues. What are they queuing for? Yeah, this is a picture of our outpatient clinic where we are running the clinic for cancer patients. And uh, this is uh, in front of our OPD, the ward, the patients are waiting there. So if you see, it is very difficult for patients who are coming from far off uh, cities, like 200, 300 kilometers away. And you can see because of this huge crowd, no social distancing or other protocols, it's very difficult to follow all that. So patients who are coming to hospital with the COVID negative report, still they are at high risk of getting the infection or catching around. So that way it is very difficult for patients, their relatives, and even for us, for each one to manage them. Yeah, um, I'm wondering, you know, in terms of vaccinations, then I know that's an area of interest for you and, and one of your research interests as well. But where are you at um, with vaccinations, like in such a crisis that you're in? Um, it's hard to imagine a countrywide rollout program for vaccinations. Where are you at even at the provincial level? Yeah, vaccination area is very difficult because uh, hardly 3% of our country has been vaccinated compared to US, which is around 39% already, they have been fully vaccinated or UK 35% have been vaccinated. So we are facing a lot of difficulties right now, 18 years plus people, young people have uh, been open for vaccination. However, vaccines are not available and they had difficulties in many states, even in New Delhi. I heard that they're not getting the vaccine. So shortage of vaccine is there. However, they had stratified. So the healthcare workers have been vaccinated more than 95% healthcare workers, even in KGMU, have been vaccinated fully. So that part is okay, but then many of our patients and many of the public, they are facing a lot of challenges in getting the vaccines, getting the slots even to book for the vaccination. So that is a huge challenge. Yeah. And uh, we had published uh, one paper and we were part of it. Can you just, Joan, change the slide, please? So in this, uh, this was a part of 166 countries had uh, come together for the studies. And uh, in this, we had looked for the vaccination modeling to the aim was to sensitize the government that uh, patients who are undergoing surgery, especially for cancer patients and elderly patients, they need to be prioritized first for getting the vaccine. So we had found out uh, the need to vaccinate a number for this to prevent one death because of COVID in a one year time period. So that was uh, in 70 years plus people, elderly with having cancer and under, undergoing surgery. So they had the maximum benefit if they get vaccinated. So that was a useful thing we got. And other issue was the concern that patients when they become COVID positive, what is the right time to undergo surgery or to plan their surgery? So patients were checked for like, if they get operated after one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, up to seven weeks, what is the most uh, beneficial time? And we found out that patients who had undergone surgery after seven weeks of getting infection, they had minimum post-operative complication rates. Mm. Wow, Dr. Pooja, thank you for, um, for just bringing us into even just a, a, a small part of the complexities of the issues that, you are, uh, that you're, you're dealing with and facing there. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll leave it there and we'll come back around to you um, in, in some of the questions if we can. Thank you again, Dr. Pooja. Thank you, thank you Nadine. Thank you.
So, uh, you know, moving from, from where the reality of, of what Dr. Puja has described um, to you, Dr. Archana, um, in WHO then, you're in um, the WHO emergency program in the team there with no doubt uh, Dr. Mike Ryan, and he has a big fan base here in Ireland, as you can imagine. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the international response um, to the crisis in India and what exactly is WHO doing and also what's it recommending? So uh, thank you, Nadine. Uh, before I actually you know, move on to the international response, I'd also like to quickly just update on the current situation because it's really overwhelmed us and you know, uh, sort of put us in action. So you know, while the, and, and at present, uh, you know, just if you ask me the right, right now what, where we are at. So while the number of reported cases are declining, deaths are on the increase and the situation remains deeply challenging. You know, and WHO continues to deliver the much needed supplies. So uh, reported cases in India are on decline, as I said, and while death con deaths continue to grow. La last week, for example, 1.9 million cases and 29,000 deaths were reported from India. And these numbers may be an underestimate given the current stress on the health system and beyond. So as of 27th May, India has reported 27.4 million COVID-19 cases and a 315,000 deaths. Uh, test positivity rate is declining, which is a promising sign, and it is down from 22.6% last week to about uh, 18 point, uh, sorry, 11.8% this week. Uh, as of 26 May, India has vaccinated 156 million people, um, of which 42 million, 3% uh, of population, as Dr. Pooja has already said, are fully vaccinated. So uh, the international response has been quite satisfactory. Of course, uh, more could be done, but we see, uh, you know, support pouring in from all quarters. You know, whether it's bilaterally or whether it's, um, you know, from organizations talking about the WHO response. Uh, WHO is providing critical equipment and supplies to meet the increased needs during the current surge. Uh, currently, WHO has delivered over 4,000 oxygen concentrators, which are being distributed to the states that need them, and uh, to make available additional hospital beds, critical equipment, WHO supporting these. Could I have the pictures, please, Nadine, if you're controlling the slide? If you could go to the next slide and just click on, I think we'll skip the India situation. I've already, yeah, if you could just open the link. So, so these are all pictures on ground, what the WHO has been at, and to make available additional hospital beds, critical equipment, you know, we are supporting the establishment of temporary medical facilities. 116 high performance tents, medical cots have been delivered to the country and we are procuring lab supplies, reagents being delivered, PCR test kits, respiratory masks, you know, uh, over 2,600 WHO experts from various programs, you know, be it polio, TB, NTDs, have all been rede redeployed within the country to work with health authorities at all levels to respond to the pandemic. So in the recent surge, they, uh, you know, support in the rapid situational analysis and implementation of tailored responses based on where the gaps are. Uh, in addition to surveillance and technical advice, WHO continues to support efforts to accelerate vaccination for COVID-19. WHO is working with partners such as UNICEF and other agencies, uh, you know, WFP and others to support the response and engage, uh, you know, the GoOn network and EMTs have been activated to provide technical support as needed. So uh, we, we're supporting the government in sharing life-saving advice on COVID-19 prevention and treatment through social media, radio, through civil society organizations operating on the ground, and you have it. So the staff is around the clock aiding the state governments in Uttar Pradesh uh, to go door to door for active uh, case monitoring in thousands of village villages. And uh, I, I can just tell you uh, recently on on uh, the on tenth of May, the WHO Foundation, uh, you know, has launched the Together for India appeal to raise funds to support uh, the WHO's work in India, including uh, purchase of oxygen, personal protective equipment, and medicines. So this, this was uh, pretty much uh, the surge effort, if I can, I can uh, conclude here. And uh, um, yeah, thanks. 
Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Chana. And I know that um, from your experience, your previous experience working in the Ministry of Health, and you've been you've had an interest in health systems, you know, what do you see as some of the longer term um, consequences? What are WHO thinking about in terms of the longer term consequences and the implications for the health system? So Nadine, um, uh, obviously my current uh, job profile, as, as you can well imagine, has been very different. I've been supporting the clinical management team and associated with very high-end research on therapeutic guideline development, you know, post-COVID. I mean, when India declared its victory, we actually actually went ahead and already did our first webinar on 9th of February on post-COVID. So, but then 7th May happened and then everything changed. So uh, it's very interesting when I got an invite from you today morning and and I said, well, this is really my forte. And uh, my, my mind goes uh, to the recently tabled, uh, you know, uh, the, the independent panel report, uh, you know, on, on, on for pandemic preparedness and response, which was recently tabled by, by very senior and experienced uh, members who've been working all their lives in this field. So clearly there's a lot of, lot of uh, lessons and know-how already in place. Uh, coming to the specifics of it and actually what, uh, you know, like just taking on from the recommendations, if, if you could uh, share that, I don't know if it's possible for you to share that link I shared with you and if you could share that round uh, diagram while I speak. So I'm, I'm just actually quoting from the recommendations uh, which were made and, and, I, and I kind of really uh, sort of agree to most of them. So uh, number one, you know, this pandemic has really taught us, uh, and as Dr. Ryan always says, no one is safe till everybody is safe. And we are all in it together. And this has really jolted us, it's a wake up call. And uh, so once the dust settles in, and I think this report then would become very important. And also as we speak, you know, uh, my senior colleague, Dr. Banerjee could not join because he's, he's now at the WHA and, you know, uh, pushing for all these uh, policy interventions. So number one is elevate pandemic preparedness and response to the highest level of political leadership. I think world over, this has been our lesson. You talk of Europe, you talk of India, you talk of, I think we're all together in this. So uh, perhaps we could think of, you know, mechanisms like uh, Global Health Threats Council, you know, which are led by heads of state and government because pandemics don't, you know, give you preparatory time. So all that has to be done earlier on. And, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of communication has to be very, very prompt and really on the spot. Uh, number two, if I could speak, and, and obviously in, in this regard, uh, you know, uh, we, we are, I mean, also talking of, you know, adopting a political declaration at the special session of UNGA in September 2021. And uh, perhaps within the next uh, six months, we could adopt, uh, think of adopting a pandemic framework convention. Uh, number two, uh, at the WHO, it's been very enriching for me and I can completely vouch for how across uh, the board, around the clock, people are working day in and day out, but we still need to work at the organizational level to strengthen the independence authority and financing of WHO. Um, and again, this is probably a detailed discussion for another day, uh, but just to quickly summarize, you know, focusing on the WHO's mandate on normative and policy technical guidance, resource and equipping the WHO country offices, uh, prioritizing the quality and performance of staff at, uh, at each WHO level, and uh, needless to say, uh, you know, financial independence of WHO based on uh, uh, resources. Um, uh, Coming to the next point, you know, we need to invest in preparedness now to prevent the next crisis. Yes. Uh, yes. And so this requires a concerted, you know, effort across the board. All national governments, you know, mm. they need to update their national preparedness plans. Mm. Everybody needs to come on board. WHO needs to formalize a universal periodic peer reviews, you know, mm -hmm. such, mm -hmm. we, could, we could go on, yes. you know, uh, and all of that. And other agencies, the IMF and, you know, all these stakeholders, yeah. you know, we talk of public, private. So this is really the right. bed of global health right now. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I think, um, I think that, you know, we, we don't need convincing about updating preparedness plans. I think while before we might have been saying that for, you know, people were saying that and maybe governments were not responding. I think everybody is listening now. So Dr. Archana, we leave it there just for now and keep moving with our speakers and come back to you. And thank you for all that you're doing in, in WHO. Thank you, Najin. Thank you, Anne.
Thank you. And our next speaker is Dr. Hakma. So Dr. Hakma, obviously with your experience and knowledge of the region, and you've been writing about uh, the current situation in India, I'd just like you to maybe think about, you know, what kind of conditions or what led to the current situation uh, in India with COVID-19. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good, uh, good evening uh, to friends who is also watching us from different countries. Uh, well, I think it, it, wa it was it was interesting, you know, when the Indian government also was in the process, you know, to announce the victories. And then what happened, unfortunately, the situation was, you know, like very bad. And then we were lucky at least, you know, to get to get access, you know, to our uh, field team. And we had, you know, that privilege, you know, to publish, you know, the first report and to share the reality. When we were seeing, you know, the reality in the ground, unfortunately, our uh, international partners, I, I think they were not that much strong, you know, uh, to independently talk, you know, and discuss, you know, some of these challenges in the ground. And at least sometime, you know, to the correct the governments when they are announcing, you know, the premature, you know, victories to tell them, well, the situation is not that much good in the ground, like what we are also so talking, you know, in politics and others, the uh, there was three main reasons, you know, why this situation was that much, you know, like force and why this unfortunate situation happened. Uh, so in the God, in the country celebration of those festivals and religious gathering and then election in five, you know, uh, states. So these were a kind of predisposing factors where uh, it brought many people, you know, to, to, to be together and then a country like populated country like India. So there is more chances, you know, for these uh, to, to see more variants of COVID-19. And, and inside the uh, unfortunately in India's situation in terms of, you know, the prevalence was not that much sensitive, you know, to detect, you know, the realities in the ground. And at least, you know, to uh, give a kind of messages to the decision makers or policy makers, you know, that situation is not good. And there was also no preparation, unfortunately, and not enough preparations in the ground also to, 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 to fight also with the second wave of COVID-19. So there was several factors, you know, like food, and then unfortunately the situation in the ground, uh, in fact, you know, these uh, food health systems, you know, infrastructures, so they had not that much capacity to also to, to detect the challenges and also to have, you know, enough preparations, you know, to fight with the second wave. However, there was uh, two or three other variants in the uh, different part of the world was detected, like the one from UK, one from Brazil, South Africa. And so these, the variant was there. Unfortunately, in India, we also had, you know, a problem also in the lab part, you know, to detect, you know, the different variant, you know, to for the genotype, you know, diagnosis. That, that was another challenge is, you know, why we had, you know, limited capacity also to talk, to estimate, you know, the uh, magnitude of the or the of the challenges so these these were a combination of factors which play uh, unfortunately you know the negative roles you know to see the situations uh, like one of the worst situations in terms of fighting with covid-19 in the ground absolutely and i think you know building on what the other speakers have said what would you see from your perspective as the main achievements in the response you know as we heard things are are starting to improve and also just some you know really enduring challenges um at the moment yes uh well uh there are several other things you know like uh, we were not properly listening and also to the scientific evidence in the grounds and if you see and you know, also there was many report published and you know, recommendation published also by the different scientists in the grounds so they they were uh, giving a kind of alerts you know to the decision makers or to the government that well the situation is not going to be uh good also in a few, few months and then preparations uh in, in terms of preparation so there there was also uh some have you know challenges social behavior you know like nobody was paying attention you know to those preventive measures and policy decisions so the, the these were the challenges and then well having you know those unlimited number of gatherings also in different parts you know so everybody thought that well we have defeated COVID-19 and nobody was thinking that there will be second wave although the second wave was not you know India is not the country where we have you know this second wave many other parts of the world either you know they already they were in the middle of the second wave or they were just preparing doing the preparation for the second wave or some country also had you know this 
uh, so do, uh, so, so com just complete it under the second wave. And apart from that, what uh, the, we, our colleagues in India also did a mistake, you know. So they were not learning, you know, from other countries in similar situation because second wave also had, you know, negative consequences. It was in, either in your developed country or in developing country. And they, unfortunately, in 2019, the uh, Global Health Security Index also indicated that India is not well prepared, you know, to fight, you know, with a big pandemic like, you know, with the COVID-19. So the score was 48, 47.5, uh, you know. So in terms of, you know, those score, the situation was not good. Even in South Asia, two other countries was very well prepared, you know, and they got high scores uh, like uh, uh, Thailand and also uh, uh, South uh, so, so in Thailand, they got in South Korea as well. So they were prepared and still, you know, they were very strict and also they, they took also urgent action. So that's why that they were very successful in other area. And in terms of achievement, you know, like when, when the situation, the real situation happened, there, there was uh, so, so some sort of achievement, you know, especially from this India diaspora around the world, they also contributed a lot, you know, either technically or either sometimes somehow financially. And then they also had, you know, enough donation. And social media, like social media was also playing a positive role. Some, some people may say that it's negative role because they were really sharing, you know, the data in the ground. Mm -hmm. And go, government also facilitated somehow in the ground, you know, they let her also the private sectors and all around the world, Indian embassy, they were playing important role. They were collecting, you know, these mm -hmm. donations and either if it is oxygen, if it was medicine or if it was some, some sort of other donation, at least, you know, to, to control the situation in the ground. Yes. Uh, um, and I think if just lastly, if I could ask you, um, is, if there's any one thing that you'd recommend, uh, you know, based on what has been achieved or maybe something else that, that, that could be done at this moment? Well, I, th there is three important aspects, you know, if we want to control, you know, the current situation, even I'm not sure, uh, based on the data that we are seeing also in the media, so it is showing decline, but unfortunately, if you see the situation, like the mortality has not been that much reduced, and probably the underreporting, which is also published with us openly talk, you know, discuss also in different uh, platform, you know, so underreporting is, I think that's one of the uh, area that we need to improve, you know, the reportings, and we need to improve, you know, the surveillance. We also need to improve, to see, you know, how we can also implement, you know, this massive immunization. So with massive immunizations, as long as there is also communities transmission. So in order to stop the community transmissions, we need also to have, to implement, you know, uh, and also to be very strict also with these preventive measures, if it is mask, social distance, and other area. So maybe the last, not the least, you know, the, now the Indian government can also take maximum benefit from today's challenges and convert it to opportunities. Like now we identify several challenges in terms of case management at the community level, in, in terms of, you know, case management at the hospital level, in terms of collaboration between private and uh, public sectors, in terms of collaboration also with these, uh, community engagement. So these were some, in, in some area, the, the weakness has been identified. So now we need to convert them to challenges, to opportunities, and to focus more on those challenges, at least to allocate additional resources. India has like 1%, allocated 1% of its GDP for the health sectors, mm -hmm. which is not enough. And apart from that, it 800 million Indians are living in rural area and with a very limited, you know, resources in, in their health sectors in the rural area. So that also need to be strengthened. You know, we need Absolutely. also to, uh, to provide additional resources also to the health Absolutely. sectors, primary health care and improve the coordinations. Absolutely. So this will also help us to control the situation. Thank you so much, Dr. Hakmal. I think you've highlighted a lot of the existing vulnerabilities and then these new challenges facing a lot of countries. And we'll be talking to some of the other um, people who've been involved in that response next. So hopefully we'll come back to you at the end for maybe a closing comment. But for now, thank you very much. And I'll just um, ask uh, Dr. David Weekliam now uh, to, um, I suppose, comment from the health service uh, executive perspective uh, in Ireland uh, with your global health um, leadership. I suppose just, you know, those who are joining us from Ireland or people who are familiar with Ireland know that maybe this was quite an unusual and, you know, unprecedented response, I suppose, from the HSE to this humanitarian crisis. So I suppose what prompted that and how did it come about? 
Yeah, thanks, Anne. Yes, it's not uh, it's not typical for the our health service to be responding as we did, and we were delighted to be able to respond to the Indian situation. And our response was was not, as you might think, triggered by the government's request for assistance from India, but it was more people watching what was happening on our TV screens. And some of these people, of staff working in the health service, and some realised that the that we had within our stocks some of the vital equipment and supplies that were needed in India that we had purchased for our own preparedness and response to COVID and that possibly we could donate this. And that was what, what triggered the response. And initially it was 700 oxygen concentrators. And then that then was mobilized by, I think, firstly, discussion with the senior management and the CEO of the health service to know that they were supportive of us donating this, this um, equipment. Then it was engaging the global health program and having that focus in our health service of global engagement with connections to the Department of Foreign Affairs and with connections to other countries. So we had experience of working at a global level, and that was quite important because we had the equipment. And the question was, well, how are we going to get this out to India? We've no idea. This, we're a health service. We don't do this, send equipment off to other countries. So that was a challenge for us to think how to do that. And then a key next step then was to engage with Department of Foreign Affairs because we don't have funding to send equipment, but our, our to the, the official aid program, Irish Aid and Department of Foreign Affairs, there was the opportunity to get funding to do it. And, and we got their support at, at an early stage. And that was that enabled the donation to go ahead. Great, thanks, David. And you could see like those long standing relationships, I suppose, between the health service executive and the Department of Foreign Affairs, Department of Health and all the other all the other departments. Um, and I suppose Ireland was the, you know, the first EU country to respond, um, I suppose, for for lots of us. And, and you've given us the kind of background to that. The fact that it happened so quickly. Um, you know, is something, you know, that we can reflect on, I suppose, and uh, think about, you know, how what we could learn from this uh, could be uh, brought into other responses uh, for Ireland and for other countries. Yeah, I mean, the, the response was, I mean, the speed was was quite remarkable. I mean, I've worked in the health service for a long time and it can take a very long time sometimes to get even little things done. And this was happened on starting on my first contact was on a Friday night, Friday evening, 7 p.m. Everyone had gone home for the weekend and a colleague got in touch to say, we have these oxygen concentrators. Can we get, how can we get them to India? Well, by Sunday afternoon, less than 48 hours later, we had a plane organized to arrive on Monday to take them. So there was really a huge amount of, of very quick activity that involved many people it was across the HSE to get the stuff ready, Department of Foreign Affairs, including our ambassador in India, people on the Indian side, the Indian authorities in India, in Brussels, uh, the Indian ambassador in Dublin, and then people in the EU. So a huge amount of coordination and people working very quickly, but on a real, with a real willingness and desire to make things happen very quickly. And in terms of the steps, I think it was about first from the HSC, contacting the Department of Foreign Affairs, getting their approval to support the, um, the donation. Then it was thinking, well, would, would this be a donation fully from Ireland or would it be part of the EU contribution? And that led to us engaging with the EU civil protection mechanism. And this is a very useful mechanism from the Irish point of view, whereby the EU pays 75% of the cost of transport and our government pays 25%. So that was very helpful in terms of us being able to move ahead very quickly and decide that we could go ahead and do this. And the way the mechanism works is that the, the uh, Indian and authorities, then they made their formal request to the EU, to this mechanism. We then responded with our offer of equipment in response to that and sent that with detailed specifications of what we had to offer. And then once that was accepted by the Indian authorities, then the mechanism got activated in terms of organizing the transportation. And then that all happened very quickly and uh, things went off and within, within a couple of days, then the, the first plane load was on its way. And just to say to them that I mean, a second plane followed with even a lot more equipment with it was over 400 ventilators, over 500 oxygen concentrators, two oxygen generators. So very big plane load. And just to give you an idea of how efficiently this worked, that the plane left Ireland on Tuesday, the 4th of May. It arrived that evening in India. 
by the 6th of May, two days later, we had an email from the Indian ambassador in Dublin giving us a breakdown of the hospitals where every item of equipment had been sent all over India. Either it had been delivered or it was on its way. And that was just, I think, remarkable work on the Indian side. And that was coordinated by the Indian Red Cross. But very impressive to see what, what they did so quickly as well. Um, thanks for that, uh, David, because I think that's that's really uh, new information for people, you know, working in the health sector or in the humanitarian sector, uh, those kind of mechanisms. And it's really good to hear that kind of, you know, the process of uh, receipt of, of the the equipment. And I think just to, to maybe comment as well on the, the sense of solidarity that that brought about. And as you said, this kind of began because of the public. And I think, is it fair to say there was a very strong public response to you know, the HSE and the, the Irish government and, and Irish people's actions. Yeah, no, I think there's, there's yeah, there's, there's quite a, a few lessons to reflect on, and that's certainly one of them is solidarity. Because when you're in Ireland, you, you can sometimes get the sense that everybody's totally preoccupied with our own COVID response and the vaccine rollout and so on. And I think this was very heartening to see that how much that actually, you know, we do care about what goes on in other parts of the world. The health service cares, the government cares, because without that caring of what of, for other situations we wouldn't be able to respond the way we did so i think that was a very positive thing to see and very heartening to see that in terms of the the ongoing response to the pandemic that ireland does take a global view it's not just looking after ourselves and just in terms of then some maybe some other lessons that to to take from it i think there's a, a real lesson about the power of the media and the importance of the media yeah. because i think it was the media that really draw our attention to it and without us seeing what was happening we wouldn't have responded and that was really very positive it also is a reminder to that maybe other situations that are bad that where the media doesn't give the same attention that yeah. maybe the response isn't the same and it's just just something i think to learn from that you know the media does have a big influence on how we respond to a particular crisis yeah uh, just a lesson in terms of the the, the response the appropriateness of the response I think from our side, it's very important that if we sent donated equipment, that it was the right equipment and suitable equipment. And we know that lots of equipment can get donated to other countries, but doesn't maybe tend to get used very well. And for, for us, there was very good experience with the EU civil protection mechanism. And I very much like the way that it was that the request came from India. We responded with our offer, with the details of it. And then the Indian authorities were free to say which items they wanted or didn't mm -hmm. want it wasn't there was no question of us of, of us dictating of what we were going to send it was very much matching what was needed with what we donated and i and i think that was that was a good process and maybe finally just a couple of kind of final lessons i think for us it was about just being prepared we responded we were able to respond quickly because we had some structures and programs in place in the hse our global health program our agreement with Irish aid and Department of Foreign Affairs, that, 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 that meant that when this came up, we were able to move very quickly. And the final thing, I think to me, it was a remarkable example of coordination across many, many different people. None of us had met each other before, or a lot, well, most of us hadn't met other people. Mm. And yet we worked together very, very quickly and efficiently over a few days. And, and with, with, I think, a common purpose. And I think that was really key, not just mm. that we worked together, but that everyone was committed to action and to making the decisions to get things done. Yeah. David, thanks so much. We could probably talk about that for much longer and hopefully we'll be able to come back to you at the end. But um, thank you. There's a lot to think about there, really, about that kind of ethical response. So uh, thank you very much, David. I'll hand over to Nadine. Great. So just coming to um, to Charlotte and um, Charlotte, you're working with the Hope Foundation, which is a you know, well-known NGO in Ireland. And specifically, we just wanted to hear from you in terms of the challenges that, that have been facing um, the, the people in the slums in, in Calcutta, but particularly the children um, in relation to the outbreak, the COVID outbreak. Hi, Nadine. Thank you very much for having us here today. We really appreciate um, the platform and the opportunity to hear from um, such extraordinary speakers. Uh, well, the, we've been working, the Hope Foundation has been working in Calcutta since 1999 and we were well aware of the challenges presented to the people and the communities and the children with whom we work um, well before COVID um, just made everything compounded, they're already challenging circumstances and uh, it, the challenges they had before 
they just became more speed as soon as the pandemic was announced uh, last year we immediately went into firstly we didn't know what way the virus was going to spread and and secondly we knew that the lockdown the world's biggest lockdown we knew that there was going to be a hunger issue they were going to have no food the daily laborers they work for their daily wage and all of a sudden that's gone there's no backup and uh, we knew that, that uh, they would need feeding so the challenges that we had to try and overcome at that time kind of prepared us a little bit for the challenges that were so big this time. Um, we, we set about feeding tens of thousands of families in the slums last year and in the streets. And uh, also we have a little hospital and uh, that was treating COVID patients at the time. And what, what we noticed since COVID that, you know, children and their families are suffering from obviously the lack of nutrition and they can't go to school, they're missing school, um, their access to healthcare was already difficult. Now it's really uh, almost impossible and uh, for, for, those, for those communities. And um, yeah, you'll see there, there's a picture of our Hope Hospital. It's, it's, um, it's now an, a, a, a complete COVID hospital. And with people's donations, we have been able to open a satellite healthcare facility, which is treating people who don't require critical care. Um, so that, that's, that's one of the wards. Uh, the hospital is in, in um, the city centre in Kolkata. It treats people mainly from the streets and the slum communities uh, who wouldn't be able to access uh, any other type of health care. The demand on the hospital and the staff has, has been extraordinarily difficult. Um, and, uh, you, you know, just you see yourself there. It's nonstop, uh, the, the work and the request for beds. And um, I think if you look at, you know, what we're trying to do now, this is our hospital during the second wave. When, uh, when the news cycle started, well, we kind of knew that there could be a more devastating wave on the way. So our colleagues on the ground were telling us that, and we, we have many, many uh, good relationships and colleagues on the ground. So we, we started to come about with a plan on how we could do something to help, because the last thing you want to do is feel helpless. And uh, we weren't, turns out we weren't. And as, as uh, David pointed out, the, the media really helped. So we launched a campaign on our website, hopefoundation.ie, because we knew the hospital didn't have an, enough equipment that it would need to provide the critical care uh, due to this variant. Um, we were going to have to help them buy equipment. We were going to have to help them convert the wards, all the wards. And we were going to have to look for a second facility. The number of calls for, for requests coming in for beds to our staff in our hospital and our CEO in our hospital well, it was just breaking breaking their hearts. So we launched a campaign for that and they, the media was just a huge help to us, an absolute huge help. And people saw what was happening. We, we, we told our story, uh, Primetime showed a little bit of inside our hospital and people really responded to what they were seeing and they helped us. And with that huge amount of help and support, we had to then turn around and implement everything on the ground as quickly as possible. And that, you know, because of the good relationships and the strength of the long term um, staff that are there on the ground, we were able to implement um, very, very fast. We were able to convert the ward very quickly, all the wards. We were able to um, purchase another ambulance and get out in the streets at night time to see how people were doing. And uh, we were able to locate another building and set that up and convert it into the healthcare another healthcare facility. And that healthcare facility will treat people who are not um, in critical care. They're people who are, um, they don't need the BiPAP machine or they don't need the uh, oxygen, but they're still taking up a space in the, in the bed with the equipment. So we free the critical care equipment up for the people who require it. And we have a step down facility for the people who, um, who are on the mend, uh, but are still not ready to be discharged. So all of that took place in the space of two weeks, two um, extraordinary weeks where everybody put their cogs to the wheel and worked so hard together in solidarity with each other and uh, just wanting to do all that we could from wherever we were in, um, whether we were in India, whether we were in, here in, in Ireland, uh, we, we worked together to do whatever we could. And um, also with the donations being so generous, extraordinarily generous, uh, the second lockdown was announced in Kolkata about a week and a half ago, I think now, I can't remember the date. Um, 
we have started feeding families again because they're they're suffering. They're living under the bridges and streets and in slums. There is no school again. There's no uh, daily labourers. They're all in, in struggling once more. And we've managed to feed 2,793 families in that space. And we aim to reach thousands more. Um, so it, again, it's thanks to the media and, and, and to the people who supported and wanted to help um, and, and also to our extraordinary staff on the ground and their hard working dedication to their to their cause that we were able to do something so, so quickly because time, as we all knew, was the essence. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you for um, just giving us the situation, you know, the, the situation. I think that when you, you listen to, to David and then to yourself, it's just really interesting for all of us uh, to understand the response and how how response can happen. And also the influence of, of the media. Then I hear that coming up um, again, which is I think what I'll do is I'll come to Dr. Shahid if, um, if I can. Um, Dr. Shahid, a lot of information, a lot of different perspectives you've heard from our speakers. Um, can you give us your response to what you've heard um, based on your own experience on the ground and, and particularly in relation to what's happening in the rural areas? So just over to you. Thank you, Nadine, and all the people that who has highlighted the present situation. And I am just take one by one that what I heard uh, from Dr. Pooja, Dr. Achana, and Dr. David. So these are the few points that I have to add in those points to make it very clear that what uh, Dr. Pooja told about that they are just dealing with the same emergency and the emergency situation uh, at this point of time. So you know that because being in the rural areas, I witnessed every day the what is the lateral impact of uh, having this kind of a strategy. When you deal with this kind of emergency, there are other patients who are dying with, uh, in lack of access to the health care and support because I know several uh, patients, those who are under dialysis and all, they, you, they, they are dying every day, you know, because they are not getting access uh, due to COVID in the hospital. So you can understand the situation that, you know, uh, especially in this case, even in the multi, uh, even in the metropolitan city, this is the situation they are not admitting patients uh, by on the uh, that because they are into emergency situation so it's like uh, uh, adding the you know uh, mortality uh, into this and it's uh, you cannot claim that you know it's only uh, covid patients are dying because of this there are other patients also uh, they are dying so the secondly and another thing that about the vaccines that uh, she highlighted the vaccine shortage and all you know understand this the why it is because of there are lots of things uh, uh, into the bureaucratic uh, system that you know there are many other uh, uh, company manufacturers they are trying to get the permission to manufacture the same vaccines uh, in a large capacity but they are not getting the permission to make it because of some patent and other issues that that can be dealt at emergency situation you know there there should be some special uh, provision for that that to save many many lives in this situation there should be not uh, this kind of uh, bureaucratic hurdles and all thirdly that uh, doctor's death uh, and the ambiguity about the vaccines and all you, you heard about the more than 200 doctors have already died even after many of them they have already taken the uh, second dose of their vaccines so this also gives the alarming you know it, it, this is also giving the alarming signals that if the, the doctors are dying yeah, even after taking the vaccines what is the effect of the vaccines you know the people have this kind of questions in the mind in the rural area especially so there are ambiguity and lots of things that you have to clear the air third i will take uh, dr david's point that how the government was efficient he got the letter uh, from the embassies and all that they were frequent but i can tell you that on third may after uh, receiving the uh, more than 300 tons of emergency covid in supplies on the airport it was lying for one week there were no information to the states that how this is going to be dispersed. People were dying due to lack of oxygen. People were dying due to lack of equipment. In the there was no other. There was uh, even the information to the airport authority. They were no. They were not having any clue that how it is going to be dispersed. So it was in the beginning. It was no strategy, nothing. So that that had added lots of things. You know, uh, you know multiplying effect in uh, creating the chaos in the country. Sir. Uh, currently that when the states are begging for the vaccines, the center is uh, giving the uh, idea to say states should buy their own vaccines as per their 
uh, norms and the policy in this emergency situation how can anybody say in a national catastrophic situation that a state should take responsibility to buy for their own citizens it should be like national strategy they even though uh, otherwise the private players will come in and they will start making the money out of it and it's it's happening there are no vaccines in the uh, from the government side but there are private hospitals they are selling five times of the uh, cost uh, the vaccines in the market so how can people can afford so they so in the poor uh, uh, if you see into the marginalized section they are not going to afford there are ambiguity about the vaccine there the cost involved into the vaccine how the people will get those vaccines it has to be at the doorstep at free of cost that what was supposed to be done in this catastrophic situation so i'll just compare uh, yeah. uh, now the two situations that earlier last year the people were worried about their jobs their mm -hmm. finances and other things but now when we did the survey and uh, we found something that people are not worrying about the finances they are worrying about their health about the, about their life so yes. the, the whole narration the perspective has changed and this kind of situation has you know created a chaos and people are just trying to say every uh, other day when you get up you get the information everybody who in india is either uh, affected by, by the loss of their own relatives or their yeah. friend so yes. nobody is uh, you know left uh, till uh, till now anybody you ask they must have uh, someone that they have lost in this uh, this situation thank you dr shahid um, Dr. Shahid, thank you for, uh, I know you've raised a, a number of, of different points there and just trying to give us the, the complete perspective. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I think what we'll do, I, I do see, um, thank you for the, the people who are commenting in the question and answers. We'll try and respond to them um, as we can just in, in writing there. Um, I see in the chat, um, you know, people just picking up on the learning that's happening for all countries around health systems, leadership and investment in health protection is essential. Um, I'd like to just come back around to each of our speakers if I can. Um, for just a last word, we're going to be running out of time very quickly, and it was just, it's such an important um, issue. So I might start with you, Dr. Puja, just um, as quickly as you can, is there one message that you would like to leave us with? What is it that, um, that you would leave us with, um, just from the position that you're in um, today? Yeah, I think we have to stand together in this uh, difficult times, because it is a teamwork which will finally win over the situation. Other thing I need, I think that we need to have a lot of online learning modules of how to use these equipments. So we have to focus on the learnings also. It's not just providing the equipments alone helps. So awareness also has to be there. Mm -hmm. Very wise words. Thank you, Dr. Pooja. And thank you for all that you're doing um, on the ground there um, in the hospital. Um, thank you for that. Um, I would come around to Dr. Archana, just a final word. What you would leave us with a key message that we could take away with us today? Uh, thanks, Nadine. I think very important uh, cooperation, solidarity, collaboration, trust, um, understanding that everybody is together in this. And, uh, you know, uh, just like taking a leaf out of the public policy thing when we say that injustice anywhere is injustice uh, everywhere. So I think now it's come down to a biological level and uh, we're all together in this. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Archana. Uh, we're absolutely feeling that. Dr. Hackmel, just a final word from you, please. A key message. You're muted. Yes. So evidence-based decision need to be promoted rather than you know the, the political driven innovations. And if we fail to prepare, we prepare to fail. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Hackmel. Um, David. Yeah, thank you. I think Dr. Archana expressed really nicely what I might say myself. For me, that global solidarity is the key to us getting through this pandemic, and I hope that we, we continue. But just from this, uh, today I was reminded just of the value of us sharing information between ourselves to understand what's happening in different situations. I got new insights into what's happening in India, and that's very helpful when we're trying to work together to, to, to address some of these challenges. Thank you, David. Uh, Charlotte, just a final um, just a couple of couple of quick things. Um, firstly, it's, it's it's sad to see that when this uh, outbreak is is finished in in India, um, there will be very few families who will have been unaffected by by uh, the catastrophic impact of of of, of the nature of it. And so, uh, just encourage people to don't forget about them, to continue to support them. 
and um, thank everybody who, who supported um, our efforts and encourage everyone to help anywhere around the world where you feel like your donation can make a difference in real time, um, especially in urgency, um, help those organisations to continue to do the good work on, on behalf of all of humanity. So mm. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, Dr. Shahid, if there was one word, having listened to everything and just from your own perspective, could you just leave, leave us with one word today? What would that be? Uh, there, there is urgent need of mass vaccination drives as well as the closely tracking the new variants. These are the two things that has to be speed up. Then only we can uh, overcome this situation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being such an advocate um, um, and, and doing exactly um, what, what all of us would want to be doing and just sharing the key messages. Thank you, everybody. And thanks to each and every one of you, all of the speakers, and um, for all of the work you're doing. Um, Hala, back to you. Uh, thank you, Nadine, and thank you. And thanks also to all our speakers for sharing those updates and insights about the COVID-19 situation in India. It has been really uh, interesting webinar. And we hope to see our uh, speakers in our coming webinar. If you like our webinar, please go to the chat box. You will find the, the evaluation form. This will help us to improve our, for our future webinars. And also thanks to all the attendees for joining and interacting. We hope to see you again in our upcoming Planetary Health webinar on June 25th, which will be about uh, the implications of Ireland's low carbon bill on environmental and public health. And it will be held on this, at the same time, which is 1 p.m. Irish time. The recording of today's event will be launched in our YouTube channel, newsletters, and website, www.globalhealth.ie. Thanks again, everyone, and see you in our next event on June the 25th. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody.